Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be back here. I want to welcome you back to the now Saturday sidebar with me, Attorney Lakeisha Dean. Um, it's just so good that um, I'm glad to be back. I'm glad to be back with you all again. Let me let you see my face for a little bit. Um, I just want to let all of you know why I do this. It's because I find that it's so important that people are educated about the law, specifically family law in New Jersey, because it affects so many of us. So this is my opportunity to just reach out to all of you and talk to you about some of these issues, answer some of your pressing questions, really in a judgment-free zone. So I like to let everyone know what's going on or what the topic is going to be ahead of time so that you guys can let me know what you want to hear. Now I can talk about anything and I can talk. So, but I really think it's more important than just talk about what's important to me, but talk about really what's important to you. Because when things affect our families, it affects how we work, it affects how we show up in the world. So that's why it's important to me that people are as educated as possible. So with that said, I'm gonna step back a little bit, at least from the camera, and I'm going to start with a a slideshow so that you can not only hear what I have to explain, but you get, can get to see it. And for those of you who have registered for this, you are going to get a replay. Um, so you'll have this information for you later on when you need it, when you need to pull something from it. If you have a question, this can be a resource for you. So you won't see me all the time on the screen, but you will have some information that you can certainly take back with you. So today's topic is going to be breaking down the child support guidelines in New Jersey. And as you know, as a parent, I understand supporting our children financially is really one of the most important things we can do and we're required to do because we're not for whatever money we can bring into our households, our children are not going to eat. They're not going to have clothes on their back. And in the state of New Jersey, as, it's, as is the case throughout the country, most of the country, parents are required to financially support their children. So in, in knowing that, it's important to understand how that works, especially when families are no longer intact. If you've gone through a divorce or you're just simply not with the co-parent, you're separated for some reason, in some cases you were just never married. That's just how it is. It's still important to understand how child support works. There's many of you who on one hand are dependent on that child support to be able to raise your child to put food on the table because oftentimes the money that we make and bring home is just not enough. And then there are those of you who are required to pay child support for a child who is not living with you, at least not full time. And you need to know how that works. Um, and one thing I hear all the time, I'm just gonna say up front, is so many people, especially people who are obligated to pay support for their children, feel like, well, I have so many other things that I have to consider. I have so many other expenses, whether it's your rent, your mortgage, your car note, your insurance, student loan debt, whatever you have to pay. And that is absolutely understandable because most of us have those bills. But what's really important to know, and that I'll say up front, is that the court, New Jersey statutes, New Jersey courts, New Jersey judges are most concerned about what your income is when it comes to child support and not necessarily what your expenses are. There are certain expenses that are taken into consideration in determining that fin final child support number, and I'm certainly gonna talk about that, but I just want people to understand that from the very beginning, because that is often, it's just information that people are lacking, so they really do not understand how this works. So with that, I'm gonna pull back. You're not gonna see my face, at least for a few minutes now, because I'm gonna go through this slideshow that I've presented. Um, that I've created to help break down what child support really means in New Jersey. Now, if any of you have any questions, please feel free to put it in the chat. I will absolutely see them. I will definitely answer them. And if you have questions after today, you can certainly reach out to us. You can give us a call at my office. My number is 856-359-5222. You can look on our website, but all this information is going to be provided to you before this presentation ends. But I just want you to know that we are here for you. And for us, 
some like right behind representation because we definitely understand that people need a voice in the courtroom but in terms of priorities right behind representation is education so we're going to do this once a month for you so if you have questions and they're not answered now just let us know what they are and we'll be sure to answer them at some point in a future presentation all right so with that said let's go and let's go with this first slide of course today we're going to be talking about a breakdown of child support in New Jersey. Now, if most of you may know me by now, but for those of you who don't, I am not just an attorney, but I do have two teenagers and that is challenging enough. Um, so my daughter is now 16. She'll be 17 next month. Woo. I really can't believe that. And my son is 14, so they're both high school students. And I've said this before, some days I don't know who I'm gonna get. Um, some days they talk to me, some days they grunt at me. Um, some days it's just, I just get a high or a fine and that's it. And then other days they just stay right up under me. They won't let me out of their sight. And I'm just holding on to those days because I know they're going to be few and far between because they are going to be out the door pretty soon. Um, but outside of being a mom, which I really, I really love, um, I've been practicing law. Really, I should change this number. It's, it's, it's definitely over 15 years. Um, I graduated law school in 2001. So it's been over 21 years that I've been doing this. Um, I started off as a prosecutor in Pennsylvania in Chester County, Pennsylvania. Um, and then I moved on to do some defense work. Um, and then I landed on family. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. But I graduated from Columbia um, University. That's where I did my undergrad. And I um, went to Temple Law School. And I came to do family law because of something that was very personal to me. And I won't, I won't go into too much detail because my story you can find anywhere on my website, and I do talk about it a lot. But it, it did start off as something very personal to me when my nephew was adopted without my brother's consent. Um, and he was adopted by a family in Canada. So fortunately, I had, I wouldn't even say the ability, <laughs> but I was the only one in my family who was even remotely capable of doing something about it. I had graduated from law school at the time, but had not really practiced family law. Um, so we kind of had to figure it out, but we did, I did. And we ended up about three months later on a plane to Canada to pick up my nephew. And that was really one of the, I, I say, it was one of the best things I've ever, ever done. One of the most rewarding and impactful things that I've ever done. And I realized that if, I could use my talents and blessings to really just help my family in this way, then I wanna do this to help as many other families as I possibly could. So that's how I, I came to practice family law and I've been doing it ever since. And that nephew is now, he just turned 16 in July. So yeah, I've been doing this for a minute now. Um, but when it comes to um, child support, just to explain to you, child support is the financial obligation by both parents, adoptive and natural. So if you adopt a child, you are, even if you and that other parent break up, you are financially responsible for that child. But it's to, it's to it's you're financially obligated to support that child. And in New Jersey, child support is determined by a set of guidelines, which reviews custody obligations, each parent's income, assets, and the needs of the child. Now, legal dependents in New Jersey include, as I just mentioned, adopted or your natural children of either parent who are less than 19 years of age, or if they're older than 19 and they're still attending high school or other secondary school. Those are the, the, the that's the age group for which parents are obligated to, um, to financially support their children. And in New Jersey, parents can be obligated for uh, college contribution beyond the age of 19. Uh, and that's a whole different topic that I will certainly talk about another time. But it's just to understand that when it comes to the child support guidelines, 
the age of 19 is that critical age. Um, so that's really important to keep in mind. Also, stepchildren are not considered legal dependents unless a court has found that the step parent has a legal responsibility for the stepchildren. Okay. So how does the court set the amount of child support and medical support? Now, generally, the court sets the amount of child support using the New Jersey Child Support Guidelines. Uh, and many of you may have seen this. It's usually attached to your court order after the judge has determined custody and parenting time. It's actually like a, a grid or a chart that has two, usually two or three columns, but two columns that focus on the incomes of the parents and information about um, those parents. Now, the support amount is based on the income of both parents. So that's important to understand too. Oftentimes people feel, especially people who are obligated to pay, they feel that the court is only considering their income, but that's not true. It includes the income of both parents. So the children are entitled to whatever both parents make combined. Um, so the income of both parents and the average amount of that intact family spend on their children. Now that amount has been determined by different experts who kind of weighed into what uh, a, a, a family, an intact family would typically spend on a child. Um, we may agree or disagree, but somehow the courts had to come up with a number. So a few experts actually weighed in to come up with those numbers. Now, what happens is, as I just mentioned, according to the law in New Jersey, both parents are responsible for the financial needs of their children. And for parents who remain together, the income of both parents is pooled and spent for the benefit of everyone in the household, including the children. So each parent's contribution to the combined income of the family represents their share of the expenses. So this also applies to the amount of financial support for their children. So for example, if a mom makes $60,000, and dad makes $40,000, then as an intact family, they would make $100,000. This reflects the amount of, the total amount of support their children are entitled to. So that child or the children would be entitled to $100,000 worth of child support. But in my example, mom contributes 60% to that because she makes 60,000 and dad contributes 40%. So, who is the obligee? And so the obligee is the person who is receiving the child support, okay? The parent who receives the child support. And the obligor is the person who is paying it. Um, so once payment is received, the obligor's account is credited and payment is, is sent. It could be sent in any number of ways, but one of the ways is by direct deposit, debit card or check to the obligee. The obligee should not accept payments directly from the obligor without really letting the court know. Now, typically what happens is, and, and usually what I advise is that my clients, if they're the obligee, receive payments through um, the department of probation in their particular county. And that's because it's easier for the courts to keep track of what's been paid. Now, it's it, that, but that choice is up to the obligee. That choice is up to the person who is receiving those payments. So I know that can be frustrating for a person who's making the payments or the obligor, but it really isn't up to you. It's up to the parent receiving those payments. So they get to decide whether or not they want to receive the payments directly you know, and that could be by check or deposited into a bank account, or if they're going to receive those payments through probation. And if so, if that happens, if they're going to receive that through wage garnishment. So that's up to them. Now, if the obligee is on public assistance, oftentimes what happens is the Board of Social Services will initiate an action against the obligor because the state's not gonna be responsible for contributing to the financial needs of a child and not have that other parent um, be on the hook for their contribution as well. So what happens if an obligee is on public assistance, the payment, the child support payment may go directly to Board of Social Services, but 
that obligee, the parent who the child is actually with, may receive a certain like portion, like maybe the first $100 or something like that of every payment that's made. So what happens in the, in the guidelines? The way it, it breaks down is between the parent of primary residence and the parent of alternate residence. Now, the parent of primary residence or the PPR is the parent with whom the child will spend most of his or her overnight time. And the primary residence is the home where the child resides for more than 50% of overnights each year. So if the time spent with each parent is equal, then the PPR becomes a parent with whom the child resides with while attending school. So, and just to back up a little bit, overnights means more um, than 12 hours a day. So oftentimes, like we'll have a situation where the parents will have 50-50 custody. And actually I just had a case like this, but it happened to be where one parent lived in New Jersey and the other lived out of state, and they managed to have a 50-50 schedule because the child was not school age yet. I think their daughter was not even in, she may be in preschool, and it's, it was time for her to start kindergarten. So then the court had to determine who was going to be the parent of primary residence. Because as you may understand, in New Jersey, the child usually goes to school in the district or county um, or even just the, the township but wherever that parent of, the parent of primary residence lives. Um, so it really, that's when that designation becomes really important for people. If they have a child who is of school age, at least mandatory school age. But prior to that, it may not be um, that significant. And some courts may not even make that determination, even if you ask, because they feel that the time is not right yet. Um, they want to see what happens when it's time for that child to go to school, what's, what's, what that child's life look, looks like, what the circumstances are, where that child is spending most of their time before they make that decision. Um, so the parent of primary residence, again, is where the child spends most of their time, or the PPR, and the parent of alternate residence is the other parent. Now, how is child support determined? And this is this is like the heart of um, of of this presentation, really. Um, so, as I said before, both incomes are used and include certain expenses for the child. So, the child support award includes the child's share of expenses for housing, food, clothing, transportation, and entertainment. So once both incomes are included, the court also considers the amount of time the child spends with each parent. That's why I, had, I just mentioned the overnights, because there, if uh, the more time a parent spends with the child, the more financial support or more money they will need to cover all of the expenses that I just, just um, spoke about. So the more overnights the, with the child, the less money is exchanged. Um, after the support amount, is considered, the court also considers who is paying for medical insurance for the child. So usually this amount, um, that is the, this is the amount that's deducted from a parent's paycheck on a weekly or bi-weekly basis. So what happens is if, if a parent is paying, like most of us will have a family uh, plan that includes our children or whoever our dependents are and include ourselves. But what the court needs to know is how much of that that portion, that family plan that you pay is, is, is just for the child or just for the children. So usually we have to do a little bit of math. Like if it's just mom and child and mom pays $100, that means that $50 is what she's paying out on a biweekly or we weekly basis for the child. So when this happens, that parent receives a credit for the amount they have to pay towards the child's portion of medical insurance. So it's not really a dollar for dollar credit, but the Guidelines does incorporate that so that parent gets the appropriate credit for that. Now, the custodial parent is usually responsible for the first $250 per year per child in out of pocket or what we call unreimbursed medical expenses. So that is if your child has co-pays. Um, so that's out of pocket money. 
So your your insurance plan covers maybe the, the treatment or the appointment itself, but you have to still come out of pocket with whatever that copay is for. So when you have copays that reach up to $250 or any other out-of-pocket medical expenses, whether it's prescriptions or you're just paying for braces, which can be very expensive, once that amount reaches $250 for the parent of primary residence per child, per year, then anything that has to be paid after that can be split by the parents. And that split can be... Um, 50-50, or it can be a split that is um, reflected from the child support guidelines um, that is according to the share of each party, or each parent's income. So if we use my previous example, then if mom is the custodial parent, she would pay the first 250 in out-of-pocket medical expenses like co-pays, and then anything after that, um, she would split the costs uh, with her paying 60% and dad paying 40%. So, <clears throat> so that's for medical expenses. What usually happens in the guidelines is we determine the support amount first, and then uh, the medical uh, credit is given to the parent. And then we that will affect that final amount that's paid out in child support. So, But it's also important to note that private tuition or trade school is not included in that in the child support schedules. However, work-related child care can be added to the basic obligation. And this is after support is calculated, as long as it is accredited, meaning the court is not going to require a family member who is uh, watching the child to be paid through the guidelines if they're not accredited, meaning they need to be registered with the state of New Jersey. So basically it's important here, two terms, work-related and accredited. So child support, it's, it's not a, uh, the guidelines or the court will not require child support, well, would not incorporate into the, the child support payment, a payment to a babysitter who's watching the child um, just because mom wants to kind of take a nap or dad wants to take a nap and they're not working. That's not work-related child care. Um, it also won't incorporate the payment to a daycare that is not accredited. So maybe mom, maybe a sister is just watching a couple of kids in her house, but she hasn't registered with the state of New Jersey. Well, that's not going to be able to be used. Okay. So, and if there are any other predictable and recurring expenses that may not occur for every family, but have to be paid for your child, you should really bring this to the court's attention. Um, and, and this does happen probably more often than we would think, because there are a lot of children with special needs. I've, I've had a client whose child um, was autistic and needed special vitamins, needed special tools and toys to help him calm down, um, just to keep him focused. And that's something that the child actually needed. It was in the child's best interest in order for the child to thrive. So we brought that to the court's attention. So we were able to make sure that the co-parent was also responsible for contributing to the cost of those expenses. So it's really important to keep that in mind because that's not going to happen automatically. And you have to bring that. If you're represented, make sure you bring that to your attorney's attention so that it can be uh, brought to the court's attention. Now, if a parent has children outside of the relationship with the co-parent, then they may receive what is called an other dependent deduction. We call that an ODD, other dependent deduction. So for instance, that's if you are separated from um, you know, your co-parent, but then he has or she has another child that's living with them. Well, the court is going to, that, that means that he or she is responsible for child support for that child too. So the court has to take that into consideration when calculating support for the child that you're dealing with on your guidelines, okay? And the court usually allows this if there is an existing support order for that other child or if that child actually lives with the parent. So it's so important. Oftentimes we just make arrangements with people. Um, we agree to pay child support 
um, and then we move on to another relationship. But if that child doesn't live, if you're the person that has an other dependent and that child doesn't live with you or you don't have a child support order, you may not actually be able to get the benefit of the child support that you would otherwise be responsible for, for that child in calculating the child support you'd have to pay for this, this second child. So that's just important to know that you may, and I mean, it's not expected that you have the child live with you if that's not your circumstance at the time, but you may want to consider at least having a child support order in place so that you can demonstrate to the court in the future that you are responsible for that child and it can be considered. So, and in order to make the determination as to what that deduction will be, the court has to consider the other co-parents, well, like I said, the co-parents child support obligation for that child. But in, in, order, in order to do that, they have to consider the income of that other parent. And this is the only time usually that that other parent's income is considered. So let me back up for a minute and explain how this, this all kind of comes to be and usually how it manifests itself in, in my cases. So I have a couple who's together now, um, but say mom was married to um, mom. Um, well, let me see. How does it, how, okay. If a, People are together right now, and um, the mom was married to someone previously or had a child with someone else previously, and that child lives with her. So she will be entitled to an ODD, but we need to know what that child's father's income was in order to know how much child support mom would be on the hook for that child. So it's like two sets of guidelines almost need to be considered. One for the parents um, of, the of the other dependent. So that's the co-parent and their um, significant other. We need to know that number to determine how much that co-parent is going to be responsible for the new child, for the guidelines which we are currently dealing with. So that's usually because people say, oh, you know, would my husband's income be considered? Uh, would my spouse's income be considered? Usually not. Not unless you you have a child with that person and you need to get, you want a deduction for that particular child. Um, that's the only time. But we generally, their incomes are not going to show up anywhere, anywhere else other than those times because we need to determine how much they make. So we know how much that, that parent is responsible for um, to get a credit. So now here's another point that um, a lot of people don't always uh, consider when they're going to court for child support, and that's imputation of income. And let me just take another sip of my water as my voice starts to drag. Okay, so Imputation of income happens if the court finds that without just cause, either parent is voluntarily underemployed or unemployed. And if so, it will impute income to that parent, meaning it will add income to that parent. Okay. Um, so for instance, if I am, as you know, I'm an attorney now. And if I decide that I know I'm going to get a divorce, and in order to reduce my income um, for, for child support purposes, I decide to go work, um, let's say, at McDonald's, knowing that I am not going to make as much as I do as an attorney. Well, the court's not going to say, OK, Miss Dean, we're going to use your current income, which may be a little bit above minimum wage. They're not going to do that because I have the ability and capacity to earn a lot more than that. So they're going to take the income that I have traditionally made as an attorney and impute that to me. That means assign that income to me, even if I'm not actually making it. So it's really important to understand that um, when it comes to child support. So it will impute income based on potential employment and earning capacity using the parent's work history, qualifications, educational background, and the availability of jobs, in, of those types of jobs in the area. So it may impute income based on that person's usual or former job or the average earnings for that occupation based on an index created by the New Jersey Department of Labor. 
So that means that if, it, you know, the court, even if, because there's many times where people do not want to come forward, they show up to court without their documents, without proof of income. Well, if they say that they're, they're in a certain industry and they try to lowball the amount of money they make, the court has the ability to, there's an index that the court has to be able to look up that field and see what people earn, typically earn in that field. And that could be a curse or a blessing, you know, because it may be more than that person actually makes, or maybe less. So it's really important to just have your documentation ready and to understand some of these principles, because otherwise you're going to be, you're going to get a child support amount that really isn't accurate. Um, now, the second thing is at a very minimum, the court can impute income um, based on full-time employment or which means 40 hours uh, of, um, at minimum wage. So oftentimes, even if a person doesn't work full-time, the court's going to, they may be working 20 hours a week, the court's going to apply their income as if they were working at 40 hours a week, even though they don't make that. And that happens very often. So it's just something that I would want people to be prepared for. Okay, so then what happens if the obligor um, doesn't pay? So if they don't pay, the probation division can take steps to enforce the order. And that includes requiring the obligor's employer to take the support amount out of his or her income or having the past due amount taken out of the obligor's tax refund or lottery winnings or just returning the case to court. And, you know, as the, the obligee, you certainly have that option to try to go back to court to enforce um, the child support order. Um, and in doing so, oftentimes people ask if, you know, two, two or more payments are missed, then a bench warrant can be issued so that uh, that person will be ensured to make those payments. Now, some courts are really conflicted about that because if, a, if the, oblig, the obligor ends up in jail, um, then they certainly can't work. And if they can't work, then they can't pay child support. So it's really uh, a last resort, but it is something that's available to obligees if child support payments aren't being made. Um, so those are some things that can happen if the obligor does not pay. Now, what if the obligor moves out of state? Now, if that happens, if they move out of the state of New Jersey, the probation division may be able to get an out-of-state employer to withhold the support amount from the obligor's income. Um, if this doesn't work, you may have to file a petition in New Jersey asking the other state to enforce your support order through its courts. Um, the probation division can inform you if this is necessary and provide you, it's a call that they provide you with a petition that has to be completed. Um, and this petition, at least here in New Jersey, is about $6. So there's not, the fee is not that expensive, but it is a process. Um, I just had a client who's going through that process right now um, to, to get child support from a parent who lives outside of the state of New Jersey. And what happens is that other state actually has jurisdiction over the child support. So what happens is if you need to modify that support, if you need to add to it in any way, want it reduced, whatever you need to, whenever you need to make a change that has to go through the other state uh, because that state now has jurisdiction. This state, New Jersey may maintain jurisdiction of custody and parenting time, but when it comes to child support, the state that the obligor lives in is where the jurisdiction lies, okay? So how long will it take uh, for a support order to be established? Well, that depends on the circumstances of your case and the services or relief that you request. Um, and you know, first it starts off with filing an application. So you can find the application on the court's website at njcourts.gov or you can go to the family division of your local county courthouse and pick up an application and fill it out right there or fill it out at home and drop it off. And if you do that, I would please, I oftentimes people 
forget to actually make a copy or ask for a copy of these documents. It's really important that you do that so you can see exactly what you're asking for and have a copy of what the court has. But so once you file that application, then you will get um, you will get a notice of a court appearance. And if it is strictly about child support, then you may have a hearing with a hearing officer. They're not judges. Um, I think usually they're attorneys, but they don't have to be judges. Um, but they are officers who are who are hired or appointed to be able to hear child support matters um, in a in a summary basis. And if you can agree, then it's something that can be taken care of in a relatively short period of time, as long as everyone brings their paperwork and they can run the guidelines, they can do that right then and there. Um, and if the parties don't agree, then you can get a, a date, uh, a court date to actually appear before a judge who will take a little more time and scrutiny um, in going over the guidelines and kind of parsing out whatever the disagreements are with respect to that. But typically, it's not even that the hearing offices don't scrutinize the, the paperwork. Um, but it's just that if there's any form of disagreement, then it'll be handled by a judge. And the establishment of a support order can take about, from application to the end, typically about 90 days or less if both parties live in New Jersey. But again, if you have to file that petition for an out-of-state order, it can take a little bit longer. And those are times that we can't predict because it may depend on the um, timetable for the um the jurisdiction of the court who's outside the state. So it's important to, and one thing to note too, when it comes to the state of New Jersey, if you need to file for child support, it does not go back to the date the child was born unless you file for support on the date the child was born. But child support becomes retroactive to the date that you file. So it's important if there is a need that you do that as soon as possible, because it may take you a while to get into court. Even if um, it's even if it's it's pretty quick and it happens in 90 days, that may be still be a period of time that you're not getting the support that your child may need. So it's important to file as soon as you you know you have the need because the, the um, support goes back retroactive to that date. So typically what happens is the obligor will walk into court and as long as the court agrees that support is necessary, they may already be in arrears. And what'll happen is the judge will usually not require those arrears to be paid in a lump sum amount, but rather apply an additional amount on top of the weekly support to be paid until the arrears are paid off. So that can be anywhere from $5 to $100, um, just to make sure that that party can pay the arrears to the date that the um, obligee has filed for support. Now, once the order is established, you will start to receive payments as soon as it can be processed. Um, now, this is something that really depends on how you're getting payments to. If you decide as an obligee to accept payments um, directly, then that, that can happen almost immediately. Um, however, if you do decide to go through the Department of Probation in your county, there is processing time. Um, and that can take some time. It can be anywhere from, I've experienced two weeks to, to six weeks, sometimes eight weeks with COVID, it was even longer. Um, so just take that into consideration when determining how you want to be paid. So while it may be quicker to be paid directly, it may also, you have to make sure you, you have a paper trail. And that's for parties on either side, the obligor and the obligee. But if you're going to be paid through probation, especially if there's a wage garnishment, then the Department of Probation is going to have to go through the obligor's employer, and that can take some time. But the benefit mm -hmm. of that is that there's you can easily look up your account. Um, you'll you'll have an account, and you'll have um, a, a way to be able to check the status of payments, and there'll be a record kept of payments through probation, and you can easily look that up online. And so can a court. So the judge will be able to see what's been paid, when it's been paid. Um, if it's been paid regularly, consistently, how much has been paid. So that's why there's a benefit to actually being um, paid through probation. So when will the support order end? Well, typically, it can, if, you're, if you're going through probation, 
When your child is about to reach the age of 19 in New Jersey, you'll receive documentation to that will ask you what your child's intentions are. If they're um, heading off to secondary school, off to college, or you know, if they should really be emancipated. Um, because if, if they're not going to attend school, usually, usually after the age of 19, then the parents are no longer financially responsible for them. Um, the court's determination is really based on whether or not the child is still under the financial influence of the parents. But typically, um, if, if after the age of 19, they're not in school, then you may have a case to have that child emancipated. Um, but remember in New Jersey, even after 19, a child can remain, a, a parent can still remain financially responsible for the child and for medical coverage of the child. Um, so you just want to make sure if they're not in school, um, that if you are the obligor, you may have an interest in determining, making sure that child is emancipated and you may want to file a motion with the court. And if you're an obligee, you need to make sure you're filling out that paperwork that comes to you from probation. And if you, if your child is going on to secondary school and for some reason the payments stop, or if you need college contribution, which is a little different from child support, uh, what we pay for college is maybe a lot more than the weekly payments we receive in child support. So you want to make sure that you file the appropriate motion, talk to a competent attorney about that well before the child turns 19. Um, to make sure you have what you need in place to make sure that that financial support is still in place. Now, what if you need an increase in your child support order or medical um, support for your children? Well, anytime there's a substantial change of circumstances, you can file a motion or application with the family division to modify the terms of the court order. Um, you can also request a review of the amount of your child support order at least once every three years from the date the order was entered or modified. Now, typically reviews are, are already done um, by your local county and we get what's called a COLA adjustment, C-O-L-A, which stands uh, for, it's usually, uh, um, uh, it's just slipping my mind right now, but when um, cost of living adjustment, that's what it stands for, cost of living adjustment. Um, that usually kicks in um, sometimes without even your input, it'll just be done like usually every three years or so. So you may see a slight increase in the amount of child support. But if you do, if there's a significant change in circumstances, typically for child support, that change has to be permanent. So it can't be just a temporary loss of work um, or uh, a temporary change. It has to be something that's permanent. Now, how can I find out or how can you find out if a payment has been made? Well, to access any child support information, you need to provide your, especially if you're going through probation, your child support case ID. And it begins with the letter CS. And you can obtain information two ways um, on a 24-hour basis by calling the toll-free child support hotline at 1-877-NJ-KIDS-1 or 1-877-655-4371. That's 1-877-655-4371. And they can give you information. Now, typically when you call, you're going to get a screener. So you're not going to be able to go get direct information in that first phone call, but you can let them know what you need and then ask, ask to have your probation officer call you back so that you can speak with the person who's handling your account. The second way is to visit the child support website at www.njchildsupport.org. That's www.njchildsupport.org for payment and case information. Um, and usually information is uh, updated regularly. Okay. Now, if you have any questions, you can certainly use the resources that I just provided you with, um, calling the, the, the child support hotline. Um, and again, you can give us a call at my office. My number is 
856-359-5222. Again, that's 856-359-5222. And your resources are, of course, the New Jersey Child Guidelines, which if you need a copy, um, you can contact those resources I just told you about. You can certainly give us a call here at the office. Um, and we can just give you, you, you won't be able to get guidelines. The guidelines are actually run on a case-by-case -case basis. So each, each party will have their own set of guidelines. But if you need to have the appendix and understand all the inner workings that I've, some of which I've tried to explain here of how the guidelines work, you can certainly give us a call and we can give you a copy or you can go on njcourts.gov um, and you can get information that way. I'm so glad you appreciated this, Monica. Um, if you have any questions, just please let me know. All of you who are, who are on today to hear this information, I'm grateful for you. And I hope that um, you got some good information here. But please, the most important thing is reach out. Let us know what you have questions about. I'm not here just to do the retainers and, and run into court for people. But like I said, um, education is really, really important. Um, you're welcome, Nicole. You're welcome, Monica, and all of you who are on to listen to this. I appreciate you, and I hope to see you soon. And we'll have our next Saturday sidebar. We're going to have one the last Saturday of every month. So I look forward to seeing you and hearing you and getting your questions on the next one. Um, and if you have you know, any questions in the meantime, just please feel free to... Uh, reach out to me. But it was wonderful to share all this information with you guys. Hope you have a great weekend. Enjoy yourselves. Take care and God bless.